Welcome to the art and science of complex sales. You've joined us in the coaching quarter. This podcast is dedicated to elevating the sales profession. Our listeners range from first-time salespeople to seasoned sales leaders and driven CEOs. They all come to learn from the best in the business. As we interview top sales transformation specialists, go-to-market leaders, revenue thought leaders, and more with only one question on our minds, how we get better together. This 12-episode quarter brought to you by Membrane.com will start to hone in on a key element in performance, sales coaching. Each of our guests speaks to this a bit differently and brings their own unique take, but all cover the topic, how to execute, and the exponential impact it makes. So let's start shining bright and get kicked off with today's guest. It's time to bring the energy. Kelly Riggs knows how to do that well. Founder, president, and chief sales officer of the Business Locker Room, Kelly has spent the last 18 years of his life dedicated to teaching and coaching others how to compete and win in sales and leadership. A national top salesperson, an author, an owner of four businesses, and a man that has an incredible success as a consultant and a coach, he's a shining light in the world of sales. His more recent podcast, The Sales Untraining Podcast, is a must-listen. We have Kelly today for the Art and Science of Complex Sales, so let's get rolling with him and have some fun. Kelly Riggs, welcome to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. How the heck are you? Man, I'm doing fantastic, and um, this this is like a bucket list for me to to be worthy, to be with Paul Fuller on the (laughs) Art and Science of Complex Sales. Hang on, I'm checking that one off. (laughs) You are so full of it, but uh, that's awesome. No, I'm absolutely serious, man. What an honor. I Thank you for the invitation. Great to be here. Oh, man, that made my day. It absolutely <laughs> my day. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, yeah. hey, thank you for and thank you for joining us in in the coaching quarter. So this is a specific quarter that we're dedicating. I think we're going to have between 14 and 18 episodes just, just specifically on leadership and sales coaching and how we're driving that through. And that's something that you know a little bit about, huh? I, well, I, I hope so. I, you know, as, as a young sales guy, I did very well in sales and, and I was exhibit A of the common problem in selling. They had an open management position and I was the top sales guy. So they said, Hey, would you like to be a sales manager? And I said, absolutely. You know, my ego and, you know, career progression. You're familiar with all those things and how that works and how it, it's just terrible in the workplace. But their training was pretty spectacular for new sales managers. Uh, it it kind of went like this. Good luck. That was it. That's all. <laughs> all I got. So I found out very rapidly how terrible I was as a sales leader, beginning with with hiring, by the way. I mean, I didn't know how to hire oh. people. And, I mean, I just really was a dumpster fire when it came to hiring. So those those things led me to really try to figure out how to be good at this thing called sales management. Um, and boy, what a journey. Well, tell me, you have the use of term there, very specific. I'm, I'm like, I get down deep on the terms, and so you use sales management, but I'm going to also create it. So sales management, sales leadership, sales coaching. I want to go into all those different terms, what they are, sure. how to do them, how you do them. Um, we usually have people define uh, sales, but I'm not going to go there with you today. I'd like to dive into those terms. Uh, let's dive into sales management and then let's go into the leadership aspects of that well it's it's really interesting if i go all the way back to college i took as any business major will you'll take management 101 you know it's it's either in your second semester or maybe your third and you go buy a textbook paul it's about three inches thick and it's divided into four pieces and they tell you they don't teach you how to manage by the way they just tell you what it is and management is does is defined as planning, big section on planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. And controlling is not like controlling people. It's control systems, budgets, and processes, and all those kinds of things. So what we learn is that leadership is a subset of the management function. I mean, you you manage processes and, and functions and so forth, but leadership directly relates to people. And if if people work for you, You're a leader, whether you like it or not. The only question is, are you any good at it? So if you're a sales manager, 
you could be a team of one and maybe just be the CRM guru for all I know. But the reality is, is when it comes to management with people, you become a leader. And once you become a leader, then you're responsible for developing and growing people. What, what I say in short order is transforming potential into performance. That's what leadership is. It's the, it's the art and science of getting things done through other people. And since the, the key phrase is other people, then developing those people is critical. Getting things done through other people. Yes. So that's a very specific definition. So can there be leadership without action or without achievement? Well, I mean, if you want to get into nuance, I suspect that you probably could. Um, I, I, I typically, because this, the management teams and executives that I work with, I mean, they're action oriented. They need to do things, accomplish things, get things done. Uh, and it's nice to talk theoretically about, you know, leadership being about being a visionary and being authentic and being transformational, which would include doing things, I suspect, or being inspirational. I think those are characteristics of leaders, you know, in, in order to be effective and to be able to influence people, which is the purest definition of leadership. I think those things are important, sure. But I mean, when it all gets down to where the rubber meets the road, my sense is we pay managers, we pay leaders to get results. And, it, you know, if you disagree with that, we'll try not getting some results for a while and see how that works out for you. But I, I think I think that's where you really make the distinction. Leaders, despite all of the academic theoretical concepts, I mean, you get paid to do things, to get things done. Yeah, I've always said I, uh, I didn't get an MBA. I got a GSD. Get you done. <laughs> hey, uh, I mean, well, because when it comes, I, that's why I love your definition. And I don't want, you know, we don't have to talk theoretically about it, but like uh, just rubber meets the road. It, if we're not moving forward, we're staying still or, and which is generally moving backwards. <laughs> you, uh, yeah, for sure. you know, so how, how do you integrate? So you have sales management, leadership. Now, what is, let's, let's start at the basics and just define what is this idea of coaching to you? How does that, how does that uh, roll into this? Well, my, my understanding of coaching, I would tell you, is very much informed by my experiences as, as, a, as an athlete. I you know, played high school sports. Uh, I played D1 college sports. Okay, to be completely transparent, I was on a team. Uh, all right. But, hey, uh, I, I was, was too. Team. Yeah, no, I was on a team for a subset of years. It was good. Yeah. I mean, I, I got a letter, you know, I was on the sidelines and, and I, I did, I played some, but I mm -hmm. figured out pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I was out of my league, but, but, but all of my work in, in training and coaching and so forth is informed by that, that training is, you know, these are subsets of leadership. This is what leaders do. If I'm transforming potential into performance, if I'm getting things done through people, then I have mm -hmm. to train and develop them. Well, training is, is the, the transfer of, knowledge about a new skill, something I don't know. I'm training you on something you don't know how to do or you don't understand. Coaching to me is refinement of those skills. It's getting better and better at those individual skills. For example, I played wide receiver in college, you know, and they would teach you, you know, as a young athlete, how to run routes and get open. And, you know, you practice catching the ball and all that. But when the, the further you got up the ladder in, into college, I mean, you better know the basics or you're not there. But now they're trying to really uh, accent what you learn, enhance your abilities. There's a lot of on-field, real-time coaching, whether it's uh, if you're in individual drills like just the wide receivers or you're working seven-on-seven -seven offense versus defense or you're working team, your coach, your individual coach is observing your actions and saying, hey, you know, you, you didn't read that right or you're break, making your break too early or you're not, you know, creating enough uh, window for your quarterback to throw to. How do we impact that? Well, I, I know the, the skills, but I'm trying to get a lot better at those skills. And that requires practice, observation and further input to improve. To me, that's what coaching is. So can you tell, and I think this is the first time I've ever asked this question. Um, maybe, I don't know. It, can you tell me, so we have a model and I love athletics as a model. I love mm -hmm. athletics as a model for a lot of different reasons, but we have this, we have this model of coaching 
and that consistently walking side by side with them. Have you seen that in business at a really, really high level? Coaching? Yeah. Like, so that, that consistently walking with like that, we have this no. model in athletics and teams and building teams. Have you seen no. that same in depth necessary? Let's make people better in business. No. And if, in fact, I'll tell you, Paul, the higher you go up the corporate ladder, the worse it gets. CEOs assume that all of the executive team, the C-suite people know their jobs, know how to do what they're doing. And, and, and I don't disagree with that, but I don't think it prevents the CEO from being able to, you know, further develop their skills. If he or she's not doing it themselves, certainly using outside people. But, but let's drop below that. Let's drop to, to middle management. Most of the time, if you've gone up two or three levels into middle management or upper management, the, the assumption is you're really great at what you do and you know what you're doing and you don't need coaching. My experience is nothing could be further from the truth. Typically, people get promoted because they're great at getting things done. They create results. They make things happen. They are hardwired to be efficient so they can put 20 plates in the air at the same time. And, and they're amazing. And we look at them and go, wow, would you make a great leader or what? And the answer typically is no, B because it's all about me managing myself, doing all these things. And, and they're great at it. But most super doers, when they become leaders, they're just trying to do more of the same. Rinse and repeat. They're not coaching. They're not developing. They're not listening. They're not mentoring. They're not coming alongside because nobody's prepared them for the role. But let's take them up one more level. Someone who's not a leader, but a leader of leaders. In other words, you're a leader, but you have leaders reporting to you. Very, very, very rarely do you see people using the kind of come alongside, help you grow and develop kinds of approach to developing those people because there's an assumption. You got here because you're good at being a leader. The fact of the matter is you probably more than likely got there because you're great at getting things done. And because you're a leader getting things done, guess what? You're typically the one doing it. You're stepping in front of your people or you're telling them what to do. We, we like to describe that scenario as you're a self-limiting team of one. You just have a bunch of assistants working for you. You're not really leading them. <laughs> A self-limiting team of one. I like that. So, so relate that to you. You told a story at the very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. You go from, okay, I think I know how to sell. I'm doing all right to, oh man, I am now in leadership and I am, yeah, the self-limiting belief of one. Like, I think as we grow through, uh, I think one of the things that we forget in, in our corporate life as we, as we go through the business is that feeling of being that doer and moving into that leader for the first time. And I don't think we, I mean, this is a general statement, but prepare for that. So no, take us, how did you take yourself through that? And then how do you help take others through that? Well, I, you know, I, again, I was exhibit a, I got promoted and the assumption was our top sales guy should be a great sales leader. And I, I was lucky in some way, Paul, I, I had a couple of really foundational skills that I had picked up along the way from a, a good sales leader that I had had in the past. So I had some idea of some things that I needed to do well, but in other areas, I realized how terrible I was. And I fell in the same trap that everybody did. If somebody wasn't performing well, well, hey, that's why they've got me because I'm the best. And so I would step in front and you know close deals or do things for people. And uh, I, I very rapidly figured out that was not effective and it was creating problems. So I, I went on a journey. You know, the same journey I went on in sales, I figured out this is a set of skills I don't have. Uh, I just wasn't willing to be mediocre at it or to be ineffective at it. So I, I started reading everything I could find. I started you know, going to seminars and, and seeking out mentors and all of those kinds of things. And over the course of many years, developed a lot of thoughts and ideas that I've since developed into the approach that I teach others. And what, what we teach others is, uh, there, there's a quote by a guy by the name of David Maester, who's one of the top 50 thinkers of the 20th century in terms of management and leadership. And he said, everything worthy of the word, he used the word management, is done one-on-one. -on -one. Everything else is window dressing. And the first book I wrote was called One-on-One -on -one Management what every great manager knows that you don't. I, I subscribe to that philosophy. Leadership is about having a ratio of one to five, six, seven people, and you develop them one-on-one -on -one 
by getting inside of what makes them tick, what skill gaps they have, you know, defining their potential and their career path and helping them reach it. My objective is to make everybody better in their role. And frankly, I'm trying to train them and coach them and, and help them get to the point where they take my job. Because if I've got a half a dozen people who are good enough to take my job, you can imagine what the results look like overall. And and that's my approach to to training leaders is, look, your role is to develop people one-on-one to the level that you've got amazing talent around you. You need to hire people smarter than you are, more effective than you are. And even if you're hyper great at what you do, that you're you're the talent executor you're trying to assemble a team of people that can crush it and if if you can do that i can tell you you will never have a problem getting a management job not ever because great leaders according to the data are exceptionally rare well let me ask you this question because this is something that is based on your description of that well it's it's hard to answer so as you as you dive in and you start to you described how you you dive into the books and you're not willing to be average at it and you're not you're not willing to you know so you're going to dive in you're going to teach yourself you're going to learn it do you have to go through that journey to be a really good I mean the assumption that a lot of people make is that you have to have to go through that journey you have to do it yourself or you're not going to do it or can you create programmatic structures that actually incent people to become and teach and help them grow. Does that question even make any sense? Yeah, it does. I, I, I think either way, it's a journey, right? I mean, it may, it may be a, a, a one that's, that's projected on you from the outside that, hey, here's the things that you're going to do and learn and so forth. And we're, we're going to provide those resources. For, for most people, unfortunately, in today's environment, my experience is most people are waiting to be taught. They're waiting for the company to do something for me. I was just unwilling. And I tell people, you don't have to wait for corporate to make this decision. If you want to be a great leader, leadership is simply a set of skills to learn. And anybody can learn them. The question is, two questions. Do you have the desire and the discipline to learn and practice those skills until you're good at them? And number two, are you willing to develop your emotional intelligence as well? Because again, it's the art and science. The science is the skills, Paul, but the art is emotional intelligence. It's the ability to connect and work with people. And the really good news for me is that you can actually impact your EQ. Thank goodness, because my EQ was probably about as low as you would find on the face of the planet. I mean, it was zero. <laughs> I'd have people that argue with me that mine's negative. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, I, you know, that, that emotional intelligence, I mean, you can know the skills, but if your EQ is really poor, I mean, if you lack self-awareness, uh, if, if you, if you lack empathy, you, you're not going to be a good coach and coaching is an intrinsic part of being a great leader. So you could learn the skills, but you, you've got to have a feel for people. But again, unlike your IQ, which is pretty much fixed at birth, your EQ, you can actually improve. And that, that was great news for guys like me. So what do you, when do you get into an organization and as uh, you know, the business locker room and you're, you're working with leaders and like, how, how do you help them develop, develop, not just individuals, but programmatic leadership as a programmatic and systematic ethic within the organization and coaching as a programmatic and systematic ethic. I mean, are there tips and tricks that you use to do that? Yes. Um, Herein lies the angst that I have with this whole process. Training and coaching is really not what people want. What people want is behavior change. You know, you you can give people you, what's the old saying? You can lead people to water, but you can't make them drink. So I, you mm-hmm. can take them to that arena where they learn the skills and they understand how they work and how they're supposed to work. But actually, getting people to change is a monumental undertaking. Um, most people don't like change, don't want to change. Most people, even despite the fact that they would like to change, uh, it's too hard. It requires too much discipline, too much hardship. And so you, you go into organizations and you, the programmatic piece is, yes, here is the, the process of creating accountability in the workforce. Here's the process of creating effective one-on-one 
uh, conversation, communication, so that you're providing feedback and getting input and counter mentoring each other so that you both grow. Uh, there, there's, you know, you, we get into the day to day tasks and activities, but no matter how well you expose them to that, if, if I'm not their direct manager and not because it's me, you know, I'm anything special, just because if, if I'm the one teaching, I would have to be the one working them through the process. If I'm not in that process, walking alongside them, behavior change is really hard. Right? I mean, the science supports it and everything we know about that is pretty consistent, that people have to want to change, desire to change, have the willingness to endure the challenges with change. And you have to have somebody come alongside, coach, 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 coach. That's a pretty hard proposition corporately to bring in somebody from the outside because they're going to say, well, that individual's boss should be doing that. I agree with that, except they don't know how. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, it's kind of it's kind of circular in its reasoning. But. Yeah, we we I, I'm not a I'm not a thirty thousand foot view guy when it comes to leadership. You know, my I guess my not criticism, but my sort of challenge with standard leadership training many times is it's is it's too generic. You know, you need to learn to be your authentic self. You've got to be transformational. You've got to be inspirational in your approach. You've got to learn to get out front and forge a direction and create a vision. I mean, was, there's nothing wrong with any of that. The only problem is I go to work on Monday, I'd have no idea what to do differently. And so my approach is to give people practical, tactical, disciplined, process-driven approaches and how to become a a better leader, more effective on Monday. Changing their behavior, oh, that's that's a task. Yeah, I mean, well, I'll I'll, I'll use a, uh, I mean, it's habits, right? It's Mm -hmm. like- absolutely. I'm undertaking this this 75 day challenge. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, a fair bit of the way through it, but changing habits suck. Why do you do it? You it's know? so hard. It right. is so hard. But so, how how do you make the most impact then corporately? Is it working one on one with the leader of leaders uh, and having them change their habits, the ones that are most ingrained and the most successful in them that have probably are probably the barrier that are stopping them from going to the next level, mm-hmm. or is it Or is it working directly and coaching at the lower levels? Or do you have to have a combined approach? I mean, uh, I know I'm I'm asking some generalized questions, but this is all about how do I take, how do I help people organizationally take that next step to move their sales and actually move their sales and move their sales coaching forward and actually do it, actually enact it, not just play it. Right. Well, when it comes to creating high performance sales teams or transforming your sales team to to create what I call disproportionate results. I mean, we're, we're not just good. I mean, we crush it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. There, there's three really significant pieces of that. First off, you have to have unique talent. And so mm-hmm. oftentimes we, we really fail when it comes to the talent side of things. You've got to get the right people in the right seats, as Jim Collins said, but it's yeah. even deeper than that. They've got to have the right competencies and the right discipline and motivation, all those things. So that that's one piece. The second piece is, you have to have focused leadership that understands how to coach, how to train, how to develop, how to how to create a pathway for people's improvement. They've got to be focused on that and not, you know, budgets and CRM and meetings and all that. Necessary pieces, sure, but that's not what you hired them to do. You didn't hire them to be a CRM jockey. You hired them to develop a team of salespeople. Got to have focused, trained, developed sales or sales leaders. And then finally, you I mean, you have to have bulletproof processes. Sales planning, sales process, you know, all the things that go into approaching the sale correctly and and following through and doing all of the stuff that are important. Leave any of those three major buckets out, you have a problem. So short answer to your question, I, I really don't see any value in getting involved in training a sales team if I cannot impact the leader as well, because he or she is going to be the one that comes alongside and reinforces everything. And so I, you know, sometimes as I work with sales teams and the sales leader, it becomes very, very apparent. We don't have the right talent, right? That, mm-hmm. And that's tough because here's a scenario for you. I, you know, you're the sales VP of a $50 million company and you guys hit your number this year, right? You hit your number 100.1%, but you hit your number. But we go look deeper at your sales team, and actually it was about five people who drug you across the finish line, and you've got a couple of mediocre people and three people that are failing. But we don't say to the sales leader, 
you failed because obviously they didn't. They made their number. But yet, how much do we leave on the table with half the sales team being ineffective? Right. And how much better could we be? And so we tend, we tend to say, well, we can just keep going. I, I think the, the really savvy sales leader understands that my lowest performer needs to be a high B plus performer. I mean, they need to be a good cultural fit, obviously, but they need to, they need to be producers. If you've got three or four people on a 10 person team that are underperforming, I can't look at you as a real success. Even if you made a hundred percent of plan, that's going to be controversial. But many times it's the it's the five salespeople that have driven you across the line, despite you. And yet, leaders of leaders, the person managing that VP sales, he is, I, I think, pretty unwilling to be critical. And I'm and I'm not suggesting calling them on the carpet or all that. It's just that deep dive look into you know how did we get here, and is it because of your leadership? Or is it because you had five really great salespeople and we have five not doing as well as they should? That's an interesting construct. That is, that's a really hard equation. Yeah, like, it is. It's a really hard equation, especially when you try and do it internally. Because you get a lot of it. That's where your EQ comes in, right? Because there's, mm-hmm. there's so much posturing. There's so much all those things across all organizations. And this is just human nature, right? That is a really, really tough equation. Well, um, I, so I how, would tell you as an aside, just adding on to that, yeah. if that sales leader came to me and I'm the CEO or general manager or whatever and said, <laughs> you know, we made our number and I'm glad that we did. But frankly, there's plenty of areas for improvement. I've got two guys that are not performing well, despite the coaching and so forth. So I'll be making some changes this year. And I've got three other people that I have on a very distinct improvement process. It's not a traditional HR driven PIP, you know, performance improvement program. It's I understand what they need, what their gaps are in their performance and their capabilities, and I'm addressing those. And we'll either bring them along or we won't. That individual, I'm like, they're killing it. They know they know everything they need to know, and they're addressing whatever gaps they have. But it's the person who who comes to me and says, "Hey, we made our number." I go, "Yeah, but what about these other five? Hey, what do you want from me? You know, I hit my number. Come on, mm-hmm. that one concerns me a little bit." Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I'm gonna. Can I pivot really quick? Sure. I've, I've, I have an interesting question that I, I want to want to ask, which is, so we've been talking about sales leaders. Um, we've been talking about coaching sales leaders. What about coaching this overall, the C-suite? Do you find value in coaching the C-suite relative to revenue acquisition and sales? Meaning ensuring that they are have have won the training that's necessary to be on the same page as their sales leader, but also that EQ to be on the same page as their sales leader. Do you, do you find value in that? Or is that something that, that, that you see getting done in market? Well, not as, not as much as it should, because absolutely, I, I would say it's critically important. And here's why. 70% of the variance in, in voluntary turnover is accredited by, by Gallup's own research to the person you work for, right? And so we, we lose talent because we have ineffective leaders. Here's what I know about great players. A players want to play for A leaders. They want to play on great teams. They want to be challenged. They want to grow. They want to be developed. And they, you know, they're, they're willing to do what it takes. But if you're an average leader, B, B minus C plus leader, you're never going to attract high level talent. You're just not going to do that. Take that up into the C suite level and you're managing mid levels, you know, managers that your, your sales, regional sales managers, et cetera. And you're, you're going to lose some talent because typically you're not a coach. You're not comfortable giving people credit, you know, you don't create the right cultural norms, all of those kinds of things. So training them to be effective leaders creates a culture where people can thrive and they want to be a part of a great team. And and I think that starts at the top, no question about it, and makes it very valuable. Well, and the reason I asked that question, I spent a lot of time in, in a previous portion of my life. Um, we, we would we would implement sales teams for a lot of organizations. And I, I personally found that the, the ones that we were most, and we, I could probably go back the data and show you 
I should have tracked this, but the, you know, the most tied to and the most was, was where the CEO would actually embrace the language and embrace yes. the culture and want to know what what it meant. He wanted to know what a sales process looked like. Wanted to know how, instead of saying, Oh, you sales guy, don't take it. And they at least understand the framework enough that they could go, you know, legitimately talk to one of their top, their sales leaders or their sales managers, or even somebody, um, you know, on, uh, that was, you know, go talk to a rep and be informed, be on, on the date and, um, but I find that so often pushed, like, ah, I don't need to know that stuff. I don't need to know that stuff, but yeah, I th- it never I made that, sense to me. No, I, I think that's incredibly short sighted because when you have no understanding and, and not that you have to be good at it or that you have to have done it, but you have to have a clarity of understanding of the role and the processes and how, you know, funnel generation works and, you know, all the kinds of things that go along with what a sales leader does. If you do not have an appreciation for all that stuff, then you are subject to anything that sales leader tells you. So you miss your number. The sales leader says, Hey, look, it's not our fault. Uh, it's, it's economy. Uh, we didn't, you, we did not get to market with a new product. Our marketing support stinks on and on and on. They, they, they make excuses. <laughs> I, I, I wrote a, sales book called quit whining and start selling yeah, because I, I mean, salespeople and sales leaders, I mean, we, we're great with excuses. And when there's a bad economy or a down economy, oh man, we get a pass because it's not our fault. And, and I don't subscribe to that at all, but the, the CEO or the general manager who has no awareness of how sales works is subject to just whatever the VP tells him. The, you know, the sales director, sales leader, whomever that is. And I, I think that's incredibly problematic for that organization. Yeah. And, and I thank you so much for your, for diving into this stuff with us and, and your opinion on it. I, I think it's so, so critically necessary, I, especially with, I'm going to take a little weird but direction, but with the advent of AI and all this stuff and people's hands up in their, in the air saying, you know, AI is coming for us all. I think doubling down on the the investment that we actually make in the real people and the coaching and the leadership and understanding and knowing what it is. I think we have to up our game even more in that aspect because of the other things that are coming along. I think AI can help in that, but I think it's not a replacement, but I believe it's a double down. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this coaching quarter and we're going to be doing a lot of things around the people development because it's so important like you said, if you've that unique talent to, to drive that unique talent and to find the people that want to be driven to their, their best, you know, excellence yeah. and, um, Absolutely. and how you do that. How, can you, can we end by doing one thing? And, uh, yeah. cause we, we're running out of time here, but if you were going to a, a sales, a sales leader, sales manager and saying, you mentioned before you need to have that focused leadership somebody that is focused on driving the person on helping mm-hmm. the person on lifting them up. And if you were going to go to them and say, how much time on average should a sales manager spend on things like training and coaching? Like what, what part of the role is that? And how do you make that time to go from that doer to that coach? Well, I, I'll tell you, you, you really open up a can of worms here. And, and the reason for that is so many times the sales leader's time is dictated to them by corporate. Corporate says, you got to come to all these meetings. You've got to produce all these reports. You've got to work on budgets. You've got to manage CRM and you've got to track funnels. And, you know, they, they, they put all of these activities onto that sales leader that when you strip it all away and you go, okay, that leaves about, you know, like five hours a week to have any kind of impact on my people. I, I, I think you're, really cutting your nose off to spite your face. It, it's just, it's untenable because the sales leader's role, if we define it the way I define it, it is to develop your people, to get things done through them. Sales are created by helping them get better at what they do. There's got to be a fairly significant amount of time invested in that. And God forbid that that sales leader also has to manage a territory, Paul. And that's not unusual as well. You know, uh, you got to manage a million dollar territory and I want you to also manage these four other salespeople. Well, the vast majority of my comp is probably coming from my territory. Where do you think I'm spending my time? I mean, come on. 
right? I'm answering questions. I'm talking on the phone. I'm doing Zoom calls if, if you're lucky, but I'm really busy developing you know, my territory. So I, I think a significant amount of time, and, and I don't know that I can put a number or a percentage on it just because every scenario is different, but it's significant. If it's not half your time, it's getting pretty close. I mean, that's my job. My job is to develop people. And I think the sooner that uh, executive leadership understands that the more we require those people to develop their people and the more time we give them to do that, and the more training and preparation we give them to be good at it, the more it's going to impact our bottom line. My experience is transforming sales teams from mediocre to disproportionate results is something that absolutely can happen with consistency. Most people are not willing to invest the time and the dollars and the energy to how much, how difficult it is to change so many behaviors. I mean, it's, it's just tough. Uh, I think that's great. And I, I would uh, I'll add a word to that, which is sales managers, sales sales leaders fight for that time to be with your people and develop Absolutely. them. If you think that they're the way to go, then uh and it's funny, I I I have to fight for my time. Uh and it's not <laughs> against corporate or anything like that, but it's it there's this constant pull to do other things, Absolutely. right? There's this constant pull, but to fight for that time to invest and enjoy it and to be with, I think is such, such a big deal. Absolutely right. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. You, this has been awesome. How, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, you can find my website. It's biz, B I Z, bizlockerroom.com. Hey, go find me on LinkedIn. Love to have you connect with me there as well. And you can get a glimpse of the other things I do. We have a podcast called Sales Untraining, <laughs> which we're trying to kind of right the ship when it comes to actual training and coaching and how all that works. But you can uh, certainly find me by Googling Sales Untraining as well. Sales on training. I have to give a shout out to that pack, that podcast as well. It's a killer podcast. It's great stuff. Thanks. <laughs> it's full disclosure. <laughs> full disclosure. Um, I'm self promoting as well as promoting him. No, it, it's uh, great stuff, and it's actually one of the reasons we got connected. So I was, uh, I was super pumped about that. And man, you are spot on. Uh, I love love this time together. You are central part of the country, right? So do, are you? Yes. Do you work with any, everybody everywhere around the U.S. or I are do. you limited by geography? No, all over the country, Canada. I've done a little bit internationally, not a lot, but uh, available where the need might exist. All right. All right. Well, with that, we're going to close it out for today. Please look up Kelly. Uh, BizLockerRoom.com. Dot com. Dot com. Dot com. BizLockerRoom.com and Sales on Training. And that is all for today's session of the Art and Science of Complex Sales. Thanks for hanging out with us and keep shining bright. We'll talk to you all soon. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Art and Science of Complex Sales. Please take a moment, like, subscribe, share this podcast on all your favorite platforms, and let's get the word out. This podcast is proud to be brought to you by Membrane.com. We are the world's top B2B sales platform. And in the world of B2B sales, with everything from prospecting to business acquisition to managing complex growth, Membrane has the right size technology for your sales team. Our latest innovation, the Coaching Cockpit, empowers your leaders, managers, and team with the information and tools they need to take their skills to the next level and to take advantage of the exponential power of effective sales coaching. With our technology and the top team of sales partners around the world, Membrane is helping to achieve our driving vision. This is, quite simply, elevating the sales profession. To learn more, find us at www.membrane.com, that is M-E-M-B-R-A-I-N.com, or contact us via email at sales at membrane.com. Keep shining bright and have a wonderful day. <laughs>